morning. So welcome to the second webinar for ABC for Yoga and Health. Uh, and my name is Sanford, just in case you don't know who I am, haven't read about the blurb for either of us. So I'm, uh, I used to be a surgeon. I now change to a psychiatrist. Uh, I'm also a yoga teacher. I'm also a student of the great yoga therapist trainer who is Colin. So uh, that is going to be my short introduction. I'm just going to speak a little bit about why we choose B for back pain mainly, just because it's such a prevalent problem. If you read anything on our social media, we've been talking about how it almost represents 40% of missed day of work, 50% of working adults will have it sometime this year in 2020. Um, but yeah, without going any more detail, I think we're going to get our co-host, Colin, to speak a few words about himself and why he's here. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm Colin. I'm a yoga therapist and a yoga therapist trainer. Um, I've spent probably about 25 years working with people um, one-to-one -one in different situations, different scenarios. And I'm really happy to have teamed up with Stanford um, to look at different subject matters, look at the way that we interact with ourselves, we interact with the world, and to use that as a basis to discuss yoga and yoga therapy and how yoga can help in people's lives. Do you want to start? Do you want me to start? Oh, do you want me to start? Oh, uh, either. <laughs> okay. So, so we're looking at back pain. I thought we would look at the medical side first. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, so I thought I'm going to start simple when we talk about back pain, because we, you know, in order to find out where you are having pain at, you actually need to know the location. And I know it sounds really dumb and really simple, and everyone know where your back is. But it's actually one of the most common things that we have to actually talk about in medicine. We have to ask actually exactly where the location is. Just to give you another for example, a lot of people say stomach when they mean the whole of the abdomen, sometimes even lower abdomen. Well, it's actually for us stomach, I'm just going to stand up a little bit. It's kind of like here for us, for medics. Um, so I'm just going to say actually the whole back include your upper back, which is kind of like the, your neck area, base of your neck, which is your cervical, uh, cervical spine, about seven of them your mid back, which is kind of like just behind your chest, just behind your lungs area. So there's about 12 different spine of them, thoracic. Uh, lower back, which is the lumbar spine, uh, is five joint, five spine. And then also the sacrum, which is kind of like the tailbone area where it's all joined. There's about four to five of them, but they all join to one big part of bone. So that for me is actually very important because if someone come into my clinic, I don't know why they would come to a psychiatrist talking about their back pain, but sometimes they do. Um, I have to first of all ask, where's the pain? Because different parts of them can mean different things. Uh, before I throw it back to Colin, I'm just going to say one of the big things is cause sometimes the pain is actually not in your back. The pain is referred by another organ. So some of our internal organs, like our stomach, our duodenum, so that's the first part of a small part, they can actually have cause pain by having ulcers and they a lot of the time go towards the back because how the nervous system is linked they're actually connected to the nervous system from your spine and that's where they're referred to that's what we call about in refer pain uh, in my research there's also a few things that can be the case like breast can go backward gallbladder is another big one aorta especially the big blood vessels in the middle of the um, abdomen the major blood vessels, if it burst, cause aorta dissection, again, that goes towards the back. Sometimes heart attack do, sometimes pancreatitis, kidney pain is another major famous one that goes towards kind of the lower back lumbar area. So that's why actually finding out the location of your back pain is very important because sometimes for us, it might mean chest pain, sometimes actually means in the front, sometimes actually means sacro. It really matters where it is. Colin? Thank you, Stanford. You, you've mentioned a couple of really interesting points. Um, the first is to do with um, structure. Um, and structure for us is important because the structure is, it, 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 what it does is it, it's the effect of something deeper within the system. So yoga starts to look at the construction or the way that the body is constructed um, based on cause and effect. And this idea of cause and effect that you have just beautifully articulated with regard to actually location of pain and whether the pain is in one place but actually is a referral from another place is hugely important in understanding how the structure of a body is. So 
first we've got the idea of the spine for us is, is that which supports you. Um, it, it's something that gives you support on many different levels, a physical structural level, and you understand the structure and function of the actual spine, of, of, of creating, of supporting your body, supporting the actual structure of your body. Then you've also got the fact is that you have it with regard to the, the way that it can support you mentally and also emotionally. So we find that there is almost from a gross level, right the way through to a subtle level, yoga looks at how the support comes into place. So it starts to sort of break out that in a way we can have a cause on one level, something deeper within the system. And you mentioned this quite nicely, Stanford, but when you sort of said, well, there's something, why would someone go to a psychiatrist about, you know, back pain? And how this can affect the body. So we've got this cause and effect that runs through the system. And as a yoga therapist and yoga practitioner, we're starting to look at what we see on the surface, where is that's a symptom, and there is a cause of that symptom much, much deeper within the system, or is the cause very, very obvious within the system? So it could be on the surface, or it could be much deeper with regard to how cause and effect are working. Um, so for us, the back is hugely important. It's that which supports you on every single level, physical, energetic, mental, to your belief system, also emotional and also spiritual. So it's that which supports you. And so this poses a number of different questions with regard to firstly back and then also pain. We break pain down into several different areas. We break pain down into um, random pain, as it were. So pain that comes in randomly. We also break pain down into sharp stabbing pain. Or we break pain down into sort of a dull, deep throbbing pain. So when we combine these two things together, you've got the back, you've got a huge amount of stuff going on within the back, how it comes to move and how it comes to affect the organs that it's connected to and also how our mind is connected also with the actual back itself. We've then got pain and our relationship with pain becomes quite important as well. So are we aware is one of the questions that Stanford has asked before of the pain that actually we're feeling and also when we're coming to look at the where the pain actually is can we identify where the pain is within the body Stanford can I can I hand back to you to talk just a little bit more about um in, in a second just to talk a little bit more about um your understanding of pain and and the medical practitioner's understanding of pain just in a second but I want to give something just from my experience with regard to several things that I'm coming across quite a lot. The first is within back pain, there are three types of people that I've come across. The first is that they're in pain and they do something about it and they come out of pain. The second group of people is that they need to do something regularly to maintain the body to keep out of pain. And then you've got a third group of people that we need to work on something much, much, much deeper, almost a psychology within the system to begin to help them with the back pain that they've got. So if I could generally sort of broadly put them into three, these three areas. And then the next thing that I'm seeing a lot of is I see a huge amount of tension in the upper part of the body. So this thoracic area of the body and a lot of weakness in the lower part of the body. So these tend to be sort of the common general things that I'm coming to see. And so if you combine this idea with the fact that actually what's happening is that each structure is unique. So each spine is unique. So each spine being unique means each person is unique. Then you combine this with the, the cause of each issue comes to be different for each person. So we've got unique spine, unique cause. You've then got lots of different ways of coming to work with people. So I'm going to hand over to Stanford now. So, uh, <laughs> very interestingly, I think from the Western medicine point of view, 
the cases that we will see a lot of the time will be musculoskeletal, will be actual pain. But obviously we know that the understanding of pain is so much deeper than that. However, I think from a data point value based, evidence based medicine point of view, that the research is not just there. Just looking at the uh, categories and the clarification of pain, um, in my research, actually, the only clarification that I can find in terms of the Western medicine is actually about the time frame. It has acute, which is less than six weeks, subacute, kind of like intermediate, six to 12 weeks, and chronic, anything more than 12 weeks. We recognize the different types of pain because we get that all the time. We, you know, we, we sometimes see people having um, an emotional crisis, a bereavement. Uh, anger, which ties into what we talked about last time. Um, and actually, they can sometimes manifest as physical pain, which is why, as I said, although ironically, I do actually see sometimes people present pain to me as a psychiatrist. Um, but I'm going to keep my side of the talk relatively focused on musculoskeletal pain, just because otherwise we're going to be here for another four hours because there's just too many different types and too many different causes of pain. There can be uh, neurological, which I will touch on a little bit because I promised someone that I'm going to talk about sciatica. Uh, there's also ones that I'm going to touch on first because I think that's the one that I usually get asked the most is the cancer. You know, whenever we get something and you go to a doctor or you want to ask a doctor friend, the first thing you ask is, is a cancer. And Colin can talk about the fear a bit, talk about the emotional and the belief system a bit about that later. But I will just be here to reassure you most of the time, because only 0.7% of back pain is actually caused by neoplasm. And most of the time they're caused by met uh, metastasis, which means they are uh, a secondary spread from the first primary site. And if you put that into context, I mean, about 2.6 million of GP appointments are because of back pain. So if it's only 0.7% and most of them are from people who already have cancer, that's incredibly small numbers. And most of the time, unless you don't have warning signs like weight loss, unless you don't have warning signs that um, you've been ex ex uh, very tired a lot of the time, uh, bleeding, or any other specific organic sign, usually is not something that you need to worry about. Similar other things like bone infection, which obviously is very um, scary and very important. It's only 0.01% of the whole uh, epidemiology. Cordo aquina, which is when kind of like the end part of your um, nervous system, your spine um, actually got compressed, and that's 0.04%. So most of the time, predominantly, although the cause is unspecific, in terms of Western medicine, uh, Western medicine say, is actually most of the time musculoskeletal. And since I got the microphone, I'm just gonna uh, go a little bit more about them. Obviously, it can be multitude of cause, and I actually suffer a bit of back pain throughout the years, and if we have time later on, I will share my um, story, but I think I have more interesting story to share, so we'll go through those first. Um, but for musculoskeletal, few of the main causes are actually things like obesity, heavy lifting, but then interestingly, sedative uh, lifestyle, so when you haven't actually lift heavy things enough or be mobile enough, uh, and also a lack of exercise. So most of the time is actually about our lifestyles and things that we can actually change or things that we can look into and maybe modified. Um, and that is from my point of view as a doctor, that one of the first thing I'm gonna talk about is actually have you look at your posture. Have you look at how you sit? Have you look at how you sleep? Have you look at your shoes? Are they supportive enough? Because once again, if your feet are offset, and some people do, some people's feet naturally turn in, some people's feet naturally turn out, and they all spiral up uh, going towards your spine, and that's recognized both in yoga and Western medicine. Uh, if Colin's okay with time, I'm gonna go into my example, because I think that's one of the most amazing example I've ever seen in my clinic. So I think just last year, I have a, lady coming to one of my gyne gynecology clinic, which I used to work in. Uh, so she was about a year after her last babies. She had four in total. The last set was actually twins. And since then she had lots and lots of back pain and she literally walks in. She looks like my grandma, I kid you not. She looks like my grandma. And her poor husband had to almost like 
you know, support her through the door frame. And then we had a long chat about her history. And then she had numerous scans and it's all negative. And ultimately it's like, well, maybe it's just musculoskeletal, although it's really, really scary. Especially when I look at her age, she's 36 years old only merely four years older than I am. And that's how staggering it is, because I'm quite confident in myself saying that it's not cancer, it's nothing sinister, because she had like about three back scan, x-rays, everything. She keeps saying that it's a surgery, which is potential, because sometimes when we go through the front part of the abdomen, as you have to do in cesarean section, it goes through your core muscles. However, ultimately, after a year, you sh your muscle strength and all the wounds should heal enough for you to be back. So actually, quite confidently, I can say actually for 36 year old women, actually uh, back pain that's musculoskeletal in its cause can be quite debilitating uh, and actually can cause you to look staggeringly older because I have to say she actually looks older than my mum who's more than 60 years old. So just something to think about is about the posture, about the footwear, about how you sleep, how you walk, how you wear, how you hold yourself in the world. And if it's okay, Colin, I'm gonna throw the ball right back at you. Especially, plus one question was, what does uh, yoga think between anger and back pain? Thank you for that. Um, so, yoga looks at, the first thing is that the structure of the spine. It starts to look at, and as a yoga therapist, we're looking to observe a person, how their spine actually is, whether how the curves are of each spine. Is it a double S shape? We start to look at the individual as an individual. We look at the symmetry of the body. We look at how the body comes to move. So we're coming to look at what causes pain and what doesn't cause pain. And what we're looking to do, first of all, is we're looking to make sure that as part of our approach within yoga, we're making sure that any action someone does doesn't cause any pain at all. So we need to find the right range of movement, whether it's forwards, whether it's backwards, whether it's to the side, where there is no pain, because you're looking at a person's relationship with themselves, the relationship they have with their body, and also the relationship they have with pain. So there's, there's, there's a number of different relationships going on within this. And I know it sounds very bizarre, but it, it there are several different things going on. We look at the individual. We look at the activities that they come to do. So we're coming to sort of examine and ask lots and lots of questions about their activities, what they're doing during the day, how active they are or unactive they are. We're also looking at their lifestyle. So you've got their activities and their lifestyles. We're looking at their patterns and habits with regard to their interactions with themselves and also others. And we're also looking at their psychological attitude. And it's these three things that we come to look at within the individual. From here, we move on to then looking at, as, as Stanford was saying, we, we, we look at how they are with regard to the use of the body. Is there sufficient use of the body or insufficient use of the body? So is there parts of the body where they're actually, they're moving it or they're compensating or aren't they using parts of the body? Is it that what's happening is that there is a lack of physical strength in some area and the compensation is going down to their back? So just before this, I was working with a lady who had back pain. And within that, she, all she was doing was pointing down to her back at the back here like this, with her hand on the back. And she was just in pain and pain and pain in her back. And my approach with her was actually to begin to work on the upper part of her back onto the upper part of the shoulders and the neck area because any action that we were doing in the lower part of the body would cause more of an issue. So rather than target the area I began to work with the area and taught her to work with an area where actually she could start to create a loosening on one side because there's a direct relationship between this top part of the body and the lower part of the body. So in a way as a yoga therapist and as a yoga practitioner, we're starting to see how someone is using the whole of their body, how they're interacting with themselves, the pattern that the body actually holds itself. We're also looking at whether there's an excessive use of the body in a particular way. And so some people, if you ask them to do something like raise an arm up, they'll do something like that really, really hard indeed. And, or 
when you ask them to fold forwards, they'll fold forwards and bounce and bounce and bounce and push very hard indeed and go, I'm in back pain. And I'm looking at them going, oh. So it, it, how is someone using their body? And this for me is one of the biggest questions because to make friends with your body means that you're starting to understand what causes an issue and what helps the issue. And when you're looking at excessive use of the body, you're starting to look at how we can reduce certain activities people are doing. We're starting to look at how we can pacify pain. We're looking at how people can understand the cause of what they're doing themselves and also hand over to them so that they can actually do something to reduce that cause. And this could be to do with remobilizing part of a body like I did today, just, just working to remobilize this, which then had an effect in the lower part, she felt so much better. It could be on the long term to restore strength. It could be to restore some flexibility. But when there are structural issues, like Stanford saying, if there's structural issues or inappropriate or awkward use of the body, we're starting to create patterns of awareness about how someone is moving, how they're coming to move, how they're interacting. And we're looking to create better harmony within that interaction. So it's creating this greater awareness of the movement because each movement that we're getting people to do within yoga is done without any pain. So it's almost like no pain, no pain, and a, a consistent process of getting people to be aware about, well, what's, what's happening, what's going on, and checking in with themselves on a consistent basis as they're going through a practice to feel what's happening at the beginning, at the middle, and the end of the practice, but also what happens much, much later on in that day. So that we can start to see what we're putting in with practice affects the body, what the person's putting in their life that affects their body, and how we can work with a combination of these things so that they can start to move themselves slowly out of pain. Um, I haven't answered the question about anger and back pain, but I can come back to this maybe a little bit later. Is that okay, Stanford? Sure. You're okay. the oh, I love the way you did that. Um, <laughs> Um, so have I given enough to hand back to you or would you like me to keep going? Yeah, um, I was actually going to say that ties in very nicely because my, from my point of view, um, investigation in Western medicine is important, but only to the extent to rule out really bad things. Like, I mean, your common back pain wouldn't show up on a blood test, wouldn't show up on a normal scan. Yeah, the scan may show a big lump, you know, um, may show when there's a really good reason why you're having back pain, perhaps because there's a obvious deficiency in the body. But actually, most of, I, I, I will actually wager about 50% of the time, probably more, they will actually become normal. And that, that is a good thing that I, I always say to my patient, you know, you want the test that I do to be negative. However, the problem remains that you still have to work through your problems. So actually, as a doctor, even, I, again, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, I'm not a rheumatologist, so I don't deal with muscle and bones a lot, but actually careful examination, as Colin said, that actually completely apply. You need to see what movements that you do that exacerbate pain, what movement you do that actually makes it better, and, you know, in the short run, in the mid, uh, middle term, in the long term. Uh, and that ties in quite nicely with sciatica, which I promise I'm going to come back to. Um, sciatica, just in case for any of you who doesn't know what that may be, sciatica uh, nerve is uh, kind of one of the biggest nerve in your body. It goes from about middle part, um, well, lower parts of your spine, all the way down towards your legs and your feet. So actually it goes all the way from L4, lumbar four segment, uh, to S3, sacral uh, segment three. Uh, so it's a collection of like about seven nerves altogether. So it's quite a big uh, bundle and it goes all the way to mainly towards the back side of your legs. So go through your glutes, your back of your thighs, knees and legs and all the way down towards your foot. So what typically happens is because the cytokine nerve itself goes through um, small holes that's in between your pelvis uh, that's made up by ligaments and your muscles, sometimes can get irritated or trapped. And when that happens, um, it shoots off lots of neural pain. So typically people mention it as really shooting pain. It's like a hot 
shooting sensation go all the way from your low back all the way down to your leg. Obviously, the region varies depending on the causes of your pain. Some people actually have numbness, some people have tingling, some people have loss of sensation, and some people have just like general mis muscle weakness as well. And that is a really good example of how um, a good examination, not just by the doctor, but by yourself is actually very important because even sciatica, which is a collective term of so many different causes, sometimes because the muscles and ligaments closing onto the nerve, causing a lot of compression and irritation. Sometimes the nerve itself getting a bit inflamed because of excessive pulling, because of repetitive use and strain. Um, sometimes something else on top um, can be something sinister, can be as common as a slip disc, press onto the nerve, and then it causes the problems. So even as a collective term disorder, there's so many different causes per se, and for each individual, it's so important just to like tailor the care, tailor the investigation to find out exactly where the pain is coming from. Um, so that ties in quite nicely in how we manage the pain. And of course, first of all, we're not here to tell you how to manage your pain. Hopefully you don't have any, but if you do, this is not the webinar for that. It's just to start thinking about what might have caused it. Um, from my point of view, surgery will always be last. You want the most invasive thing to be the last resort, which is always the case. And especially on, on an area like your back, because any surgery is going to increase scar tissues, obviously, and it's going to create a weakness. So any structure that's already a little bit weak or vulnerable to begin with, you don't want to do any excessive, you know, surgical excision onto that unless it's absolutely necessary. Medicine is great. You can have painkillers. Uh, if you are not allergic like myself, I strongly recommend NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So things like ibuprofen, diclofenac, they can come in a gel form, which is actually much better because you bypass a lot of the systemic side effect like um, uh, gastric ulcers, gastric bleeding. However, they're still not great. They're good because they take down the inflammation. However, only in the duration that they're working. And of, of course, you have to deal with the side effects as well. So the best thing is actually kind of like the investigation, finding out what is causing the pain and finding out what makes it better and how you can enhance those um, effects from betterment. So maybe it's movement, uh, yoga obviously great, but obviously other form of exercise too, yeah? So some people find swimming is really good because of the suspension from gravity is amazing. Some people find strengthening exercise like cycling, running, um, or core exercise because the more you strengthen the front, the more you give support to the back as well. Uh, heat compression is actually really good because obviously it gives a little bit more blood flow to the area and helps the, air, the muscles to relax a little bit. Um, I'm slightly holistic, so I always recommend if you can find a good acupuncturist, that's good. Um, osteopath manipulation or chiropractor, I should say, and manipulation may be good, but again, please find one that you can trust. So, because sometimes, especially in area where it's nerve related, you want them to be good or you trustworthy at least. And again, good shoe wears. So, ladies, if you have a lot of back pain, maybe look at your high heels. They are not your friends. Gentlemen too, if you have proper formal wear shoes, they are also not your friends because most of the time, if you imagine this is my foot, this is what your toes are doing at the front of the shoes and then you raise the heel. So really like taking a lot of the natural support that your foot actually gives to your entire body. So as much as you can, try to get comfortable footwear. Most of the time people don't look at your feet, look at your feet anyway, so it really doesn't matter what you wear actually providing, you know, comfort for your body so you can use it for another 50 years, probably the most important thing in my eyes. Um, I think I've spoken enough. Colin, anything to add other than footwear? Well, um, let me just dive back over um, what we've just covered. It, it, so we've got a back. I'm not going to go into the structure of the spine. We've, we've, we can cover the structure of the spine. We've got hard tissue. We've got soft tissue we can start to differentiate between hard tissue and soft tissue. So we can start to look at whether something is to do with the actual bone structure, to do with the disc, which Stanford mentioned, to do with the nerves, to do with the muscles deep in the, deep in the structure or towards the surface. We can start to um, begin to understand just a little bit more about the person, about their history, about more about them, about how they interact, how they lead their lives and the things that they do. 
we can start to understand whether they're overusing or underusing the body because the body needs to serve them for the whole of their life. And so how are they coming to interact with their body? And to understand the pattern of that interaction, the habit of that interaction, start to lay down the new pattern of working. So it could be that they're dealing with structural issues and they could be that they're doing, dealing with excessive use of the body or it could be insufficient use of the body. So it could be in these different areas. Um, and it could be that, and, and, and you know, we can generally say that it, it, it could be that what happens is that they just need to do a few things and they're out of pain quite quickly or they need to do something on a regular basis to keep themselves out of pain or they need to work on a very much longer term basis. So we've got these areas here. The thing that I'm finding quite interesting is that we've got a physical structure. We've got lots of nerves. It means that the nervous system is involved in this. And as a yoga practitioner, I'm an advocate of breathing, advocate of breathing and gentle movement. And it's the most unbelievable thing that when you apply gentle movement with smooth, conscious breath with the right movement for the structure, it settles the nervous system completely. And so if you think about how, what pain does to the system, if you think about the effect of how a person responds when they're in pain, I mean, quite often there's a huge amount of fear involved. The fact is things will never be the same again. I won't be able to walk. I won't be able to do this. I can't do that. You know, I can't play tennis. I can't do this. I can't do this. Suddenly what happens is there's a whole load of stuff that comes up for people as part of this. And it brings up their identity with who they think they are. And it challenges them because it's different from who they actually are at that moment. And it's also different from who they want to be. So there's a number of different things that are going on within this process for people and their relationship with their spine and relationship with their back. It, so we're starting to look at and put in place gentle movement. And the movement could be, let's say, what I mean by gentle movement, it could be the, the position static with breathing, or it could be that you're using movement and breathing. But the key within this is breathing. Breathing that allows the body and the mind to come together. And what I mean by breathing is that the breathing is bigger than the movement. The breathing is the priority. And it's the laying down of the breathing process that affects the nervous system and affects the body that is hugely important as part of any direction forwards within yoga and yoga therapy. And it's not short, sharp breaths. It's not short, aggregated movements. All of it is about being very gentle, being very considerate, being the opposite of abrupt, being very kind, being very thoughtful, actually using your breath to investigate the movement of your body and discover new things about your body as part of what you're doing. So I just want to open the doorway to breathing and breathing as a huge help to back pain because, and the effect that breathing has on the nervous system. And could I hand back to Stanford, is that okay? If you want to say anything more about this because your understanding of the nervous system is superb. And so, if there's anything that you feel that I've missed or, or would like to say more about, please. Uh, no, um, I think that talking about breathing is perfect. Uh, however, just before I go into that, I'm going to diverge. And first of all, thanks to Paul, who's, who's a great behind the scenes guy. I should have thanked him a little bit earlier on. And also, I know Colin speaks in such a nice, calm voice, but I do speak quite fast. So if anything that either of us is not being clear about or you have any burning question, please put it into the chat box so we can kind of start answering your question as we go along, because I can see a few bubbles forming around your head and the few burning questions as we go along. So please feel free to just pop them into the chat and I'll monitor the chat the whole time and Paul will help too. Um, I think breathing on its own right is such a beautiful tool for pain in general. As I've said before, I'm, I used to be obstetrician, so I see a lot of women in labor and actually just helping them through their breathing is such a good way to one, get them back into that moment of time, but also at the same time, also kind of calming them down a little bit. Um, 
I, I know there are more and more combined studies between the Eastern medicine as, as well as the Western medicine in terms of the field of pain. I have to say, as far as I come across, there's not a lot of recognized data, although there are thousands of years of literature in terms of sutra and Chinese medicine that you can go into if you want to. Um, in terms of Western medicine, we, we talk about breathing, but it's not as evidence-based per se. However, I will speak from my own experience. Um, if any of you uh, lovely ladies uh, who have seen, or those of you who have seen the movies or anything, uh, in pregnancy, in childbirth, sometimes people use gas and air, you know, the laughing gas. Um, and I personally believe one of the biggest effects that has on analgesia in terms of pain relief is actually taking you to the focus of the breathing. And I actually was a doula for one of my dear friends um, just a year ago, and she told me that as well. It's actually just focusing herself back into that breathing moment is so important in terms of kind of distracting one from the pain, but also at the same time, actually is a management of the pain. Um, but in terms of management itself, I, I want to say f I completely echo what Colin has said as well, because I, as I said already, I have quite a few back pain myself um, that resulted from a knee injury years and years ago. So it caused my pelvis to be slightly misaligned and it goes into my bag, you know, eventually. So actually, I'm definitely coming to the second category that Colin has mentioned before, where I need a lot of like slow, steady work every now and then just to kind of rejiggle my pain. And I think in terms of my own back pain journey, I learned that there's no one size fix all. Sometimes one problem, sometimes because of my knee, and that might be better. And then sometimes I realize it's actually the foot on the other side. Sometimes can be my shoulder because I've been overusing it when I'm climbing. And it seems to be whenever I have a weakness in one place, which at the moment is my back, or um, as well as my knee, but my back mainly, um, it's very common that it will go towards that side. Uh, any, any problems that's happening in my life, I, I compensate with my back very, very quickly because there's a weakness there. And I'll just tie in quickly with the Chinese medicine side because that's a special interest of mine. Um, I, I see a really lovely Chinese medicine specialist where she told me actually the back muscle, the erector spinae, I think that's what she's meaning, which is the muscle next to your spine. So they are actually uh, yang muscles. So they're kind of like the positive, the the the... the the lighter muscle. So in what it means is they should be acting as a airbag. They should be like more supportive. Uh, it may sound a bit weird, but if you think about yin, which is more solid, which is more um, grounding, they don't bend a lot. So they're actually not very supportive. They may feel very solid, but they're not very supportive because they can't really move with you. The back muscle is supposed to be quite empty per se. So it should be quite fluid. So it actually can move with you and support all your movement. For me, I'm very flexible with the injury at the same time. So actually my, my muscle have to overwork and overcompensate. And I have to say, actually, I might throw this back to Colin very soon. Um, this is some, something quite common in yoga teacher because most of us are rather flexible. Actually, as I come to know that most of us can have back pain too. Thank you. I, I come across a lot of back pain within yoga teachers. Um, huge amount of back pain. Um, there's a number of things that I, I come across on a regular basis. It, it, overstretching tends to be one of them. Um, so people take their bodies sort of further and further beyond limits than actually the bodies are comfortable with. And in a way, it, it, especially when you're in a, a, an area where you know, people want to sort of achieve certain things or do you know positions or do things is that they can put themselves in a situation where they don't understand how to use their body so they actually push themselves beyond the limit of how their body is and any kind of movement that's very 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 intense very um almost that you're having to use a lot of stretching a lot of stretching a lot of stretching any overforcing, um, any kind of action that has limited breathing within it will create an issue within uh, and it will exacerbate any pain that there is within the back. I think understanding the structure that you're given and how your structure moves and coming to live alongside that is one of the most important things within yoga. 
each of our structures is different and I mean completely different. So what I can do is different to what Stanford can do. And what I could do 10 years ago is different to what I'm doing now. And it, it, it means that the approach that we're coming to take and that we're working with is one that's based on the situation that every person is in, what they're doing in their life, what their capabilities are, what their potentials are, what their energies are. And we're making sure that they can maintain the health of their back and maintain their body so that they can function on a regular daily basis. The last thing is that it, it, it's almost, I spoke to a lady this week and, and she said to me, you know, I get, I can't lie in one position for more than, you know, half an hour in bed at night. So in, she's on her back and she's on one side. Then she goes onto the front, she goes into spasm. So she goes onto the other side and then she goes onto another side and goes into her back. And the whole of her night is spent like this. And if you imagine the effect that that has on her, she's got two young children. She isn't getting much sleep at all. She's in constant pain. She's sick of the pain. And the question is, is what to do about this? What's the cause of this? Where she's feeling the pain is different to what the cause of the pain actually is. And the approach that's taken is one that takes patience and takes a lot of time. So it means that we need to observe and we need to look at every situation like this as a huge opportunity. I know it sounds really bizarre, but you're kind of like, you're in back pain. You want to get out of back pain very, very quickly. Okay, I'm in back pain, I want to get out. I don't want it anymore. I don't want to wake up in the night. I don't want to do this. But for me, I'm presenting it as an opportunity. It's an opportunity that you can empower yourself to rebuild yourself, that you can actually do something on a regular basis to help yourself, to learn more about yourself and to move forward in your life and evolve forward to do something differently than you've done before. And it means not going back to your old patterns, your old habits, your old way of working, but starting to discover not the fact that you're restricted, but how do I come to find a way forwards. Otherwise what happens is that we then get in place um, a number of different things, which is almost it's the memory of the pain which holds us back. So I've done numbers of different um, case studies. I think some of you were at a, a, a seminar that I did where we, we were inviting people in and this, this one person came in and he was, he said, look, I have to bend my legs at the knees both of them at the knees because I've got an imbalance in my pelvis, otherwise it goes up into my back. And because the, the, my legs are uneven in length. And we did an inspection of this guy and it, it, it wasn't the case, but he took this habit and this pattern, he had to go in this direction, otherwise he thought he was gonna get in pain. So there is almost in a way when we have pain, there is also a memory of that pain. And so we're dealing with lots of different things as a yoga therapist when we're working with people with pain, especially pain within their back because they want to protect themselves. They want to almost, like you mentioned, Stanford, this 36 year old lady that came in and she looked really old. She, she, in a way, you, you're taking this, this pattern and sometimes we stoop or we go into this position, we put our hands on our back and we just stay there in a particular way and we don't want to go in any direction at all apart from there because we know we're safe there. And we don't want to investigate any further direction out of this because we feel safe in that one area. Have you come across anything like this, Stanford? Um, yes, and actually that ties into a question very nicely. Um, but first of all, I'm, I'm just gonna say my experience was I think as we grow older, and I mean, we're all in this journey together, every single day we're gonna get another day older, there are certain amounts of wear and tear that we have to take in our body. And I think Colin's way of saying how we actually live with that pain and how we manage it is beautiful because you know, every single action you do, there will be a counteraction. That's what I believe, you know, you do something, there will be some effects on your body in some way. And you know, no matter how you walk, how you sit, how you stand, it, it just will naturally happen. Um, 
sometimes it's learning about what to avoid, sometimes learning about what to modify, and sometimes learning what to do more of. And that kind of residue, I, I'm probably going to use that word because that's probably the best way to, or, um, to describe it. What kind of residue left on your body can be physical, but actually can be emotional. Because as Carol's asking, uh, can, have either of us come across depression and back pain happening at the same time? Because she noticed that in her yoga class. Part of the reason why I asked Colin about anger and back pain is because actually today I got really agitated on the tube because someone wasn't wearing the mask properly and that got re me really, really angry. So I, I kind of almost wish that it was last month when I can talk about anger properly when I was actually angry. But I notice in myself um, when I'm angry, I'm holding myself and kind of like, you know, that inward turning shoulder action, which actually sometimes we do a lot in all, a lot of other negative emotion as well, because we know um, evolutionary speaking, uh, the front line of the body is way more visceral, so it's more, much more soft tissues. So when, whenever there's a negative emotion in us, we want to kind of close off the front to protect ourselves, which is why in a lot of yoga postures that at least in my teaching I do that, um, actually opening the front can be very freeing and also can be very calming because animals only do that. If any of you have cats and dogs, you know that. You know, they only show you their inside if they feel safe enough to you. They want you to pat and stroke them on the inside because they feel safe. Um, so yeah, I, I, I actually would agree. If you have severe depression, severe um, anger, or any other negative emotion, it is quite natural for your body to close up to want to use the skeletal part of your body. So the back, the spine, the legs, all the bony parts to protect yourself. And if you hold onto that kind of posture for a long time, obviously the muscle is going to start to ache and, you know, wear and tear, so on and so forth. That's going to lead to pain. Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure Colin has a much better and much more eloquent way of explaining that. <laughs> so please go ahead. No, you, you've, you've, you've expressed it really clearly. And what I like is it, is, it, is it mirrors what I'm seeing on almost a daily basis with people. This tension in the upper part of the body, the tension around the, particularly the thoracic upper part, into the shoulders, around the scapula, onto right up into the neck, into across the neck, into the jaw, into the jawline. This tension um, is tension which is based on the way that we hold our position, the way that we work, the way that we take a habit of interacting with the world. But it's also a, an emotional position that we take as well. And if you think that if it, it, one area becomes very tight, it means the other area has to do a lot of work. And if what happens is that that area at the top is tight and that lower area has to do a lot of work, that puts it under a lot of vulnerability. So we find ourselves with that if I got more and more tension happening up the top because of emotion, because of like this, then I've got more and more issues that are going to happen down at the bottom. So I really like what you said, Stanford, about the way that emotion is started to be expressed through the whole body and how the body is held because of what's happening deeper within it. To release tension, to release emotion, to process tension, to process emotion is a huge subject matter. Um, and for me, it's a subject matter very similar, almost aligned, akin to the meditation process. So it's getting a coherence, a new coherence of this deep process within us. For me, when there is this type of issue, the target of what's happening in the top area of the body becomes important. So to target around the neck, the shoulders, the upper part of the back, to use lots of techniques to settle this area here and almost to avoid anything within the lower part. Now, it means that I'm starting to look at symmetry within the body. I'm starting to look at how the, how the body is symmetrical, what's overworking, what's underworking. I'm starting to test again and again and again to understand the symptoms so that I can begin to understand the causes. 
So I'm getting people to move, to turn their head, to move an arm, to move a leg, to lots of different things. I want to make sure that every different action that they're doing, I'm understanding its cause and effect within the system, how that's rippling through the system. I'm also looking at all costs to put in place as much as possible to reduce symptoms. And what I mean by this is I'm starting to look at not just physical interaction, I'm starting to look at emotional interaction as well. So how they hold emotion, how they work with emotion, how they've learned to process emotion or suppress emotion or block emotion. And so when we talked about anger last time we met, we looked at, we were looking at three components and we defined anger in a particular way. We looked at anger in relation to desire. And we looked at it with regard to attachment and we looked at it with regard to identity. And so we started to look at numbers of different questions associated with this with anger. But if you think about the effect of emotion on the body, it is, it's quite substantial. You can see the expansion and contraction of a body straight away based on how a person is. But then you can also see the effect of that emotion on the body and the person actually doesn't realize often they don't realize what's going on they don't see what you never see it when you're too close to it you know if that makes any sense it, it makes a lot of sense to me um because I, I i i link back to my experience because um like shanine who's asked the next question i had quite a lot of like massage and acupuncture around my back as well and i think just like you said, Colin, sometimes when there's an area that's pain, I can almost sense it from the therapist. You don't want to work on that area directly, which I, I know is not a very Western approach because I, I can see that from my job where sometimes when you see a problem, you want to solve it head on. Actually, sometimes you want to release the tension elsewhere first, kind mm -hmm. of let off sleep, like kind of like what we talked about last time about anger. You kind of want to let off steam a little bit so it's not too pent up and and then you can see if you can turn off the heat somewhere else. Um, uh, that, that is, that is going to be my experience. Um, as for Shanine, who asked about, she has tension in her left-hand side of the body, clicking jaws down to my arm. Any suggestions? So she had tried acupuncture and massage. I will say from my personal experience, because again, I have same things. I have many other different things, yoga, swimming included. Um, I think everything helps and also sometimes everything doesn't help. Uh, everything helps means because sometimes you, when you have different modality of treatments, they, get, they can give you quite conflicting advice. And actually, I think ultimately from my personal experience, they are all correct because they are looking at the same problem, but just slightly different ways. So sometimes it's about if one person say, actually, you need to use your right side a little bit more because you're favoring your right side, uh, your left side too much. That's why you're getting the pain. They might be right. They may be saying, actually, your top part of your left-hand side is giving you the problem because your left foot is the problem. That can also be true. Because again, we, we see pain as such a singality, you know, one single problem, but actually sometimes multiple issues feed into them, just like Colin's saying, it can be physical, it can have so many layers in your emotion, in your belief, uh, in your energy level, so on and so forth. So uh, from my point of view, keep seeing what helps. Again, I don't think any of the things that you try is wrong and just kind of see which one will help you the most. And also keep listening, keep an open, open ear just to see what's going on. But Colin probably have a slightly better, again, as always, slightly better answer. I disagree with you completely. Um, I don't know the answer, if that makes any sense. Um, <laughs> so, Sinead, I, I, again, I, have to look at and, and observe really carefully how how you were moving how your structure was what was happening within your structure to understand a little bit more about what was going on um, I would also have to do lots of tests to understand sort of the causes of what's happening as well um, and without seeing you I wouldn't know um, so I, I can't make any suggestions but what I would look to do is I'd look to examine exactly what's happening in your spine particularly into the cervical vertebrae and in and down the cervical vertebrae particularly and whether there was a difference in this area here and your shoulders 
and maybe whether the head was forward, backwards to the side or the other side. So actually looking at the position of the head and also to look at why there is this, what, where there is this tension or this clicking that's occurring within the jaw, what's happening in there and how that's correlated into the, to the makeup of all of this. Um, so this would be my direction. It would be to reduce symptoms and give your practice to reduce symptoms. Um, so I can't give a 100% answer, I'm sorry, without seeing you, so sorry about that. Um, I'd love to be able to, because um, that leads me to the next thing, is that what I've discovered, and I remember when I first started um, teaching yoga, is I really thought that if you did that, then this would happen. I thought I found the formula for for you know for back pain. I thought, yeah, yeah you, this is what happens. You have the formula for back pain. It's quite simple. So if what happens is that the person has back pain, where what happens is they they move forwards and it's aggravated. Okay, solution: just get them to move backwards. Or if what happens is that they move backwards and they get back pain, well, the solution is just to move forwards. And I thought this was, you know, what it's very simple. Back pain, I could get that sorted in, in minutes. But actually I realized that there isn't a, there isn't a kind of like on off the shelf program for generally dealing with back pain. There isn't one of those sort of things that if you do this, that happens. It, it's, it, it's really challenging because actually what we want is we, is we want a, a, a you know, almost an off-the-shelf program that we, if we do this, that'll happen and it's all sorted. And, and it's almost frustrating to people because it, it, it's put this, it puts them in a position where they need to learn something about themselves and they need to do something slightly different than a you know, a package that is, you know, if I do this, 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 and this, that's what happens. And actually sometimes it exacerbates the condition quite a lot. I, I don't know if that was clear, um, Stanford. No, it was clear. And see, you, you gave a much better answer than I did. See you. That I've, I completely... I, no, I disagree with you. You keep saying that. You're so full of flattery. It's unbelievable. Um, no, but I, I also want to say, actually, I really echo what you said as well, because what you said remind me of something. It's a very similar case to what you have seen in your class. Some of you might actually remember that person. Uh, someone come to my class, practice in a certain way and always bend her knee, uh, his knees because of some back issues. And again, it's there's not anyone here, so don't worry, I'm not talking about you. Um, but he modified the way that he practiced because a really good yoga teacher told him like a few years ago, if you can see that his body is able to do something slightly further and slightly different, I, at that point it was actually his belief that he think, no, I've been told um, I've been told that uh, I need to practice in a certain way, so I need to continue because otherwise it wouldn't work for me. Uh, it will cause pain. And I think sometimes when you work with pain and also your muscles and your body, um, sometimes go deeper, you go to your nerve, go to your skin, go to your bones, go to your ligaments. Uh, the, having that constant open mind, kind of like what I said earlier on about different therapists, different treatment modality, you also have to keep an open mind with yourself because you, I, I, I learned that from myself that Sometimes the same problem can have different cause and I have to know that I'm evolving with time. I'm evolving with things I'm doing. I'm evolving with the treatment that I've had. So sometimes something that has caused the pain 10 years ago may no longer cause pain because I practice differently now. However, the practice I had 10 years ago may no longer work for me because one, my pain's different, two, my body's different, and three, my practice is different. And I think having that constant kind of fluidity is, oh, well, I, I find it fascinating because I, I, I'm i weird. Um, but I just kind of, like, it's always a new discovery, which is why I say on the mat is amazing, in clinic is also amazing. But I think for the journey for yourself, you've, especially if you're paying anywhere in your body, especially your back, kind of just constantly examining it and also keep an open mind because that's probably by far the best advice I've, give, I've gotten so far. Thank you so much. Um, 
so in a way pain is the body's way of communicating with you so it's the only method it's the only it's the only way that the body has to let you know something and so it's it's a communication method and so we need to develop a listening method one where we listen attentively but don't almost become over listening do you know what i mean no, no you know really anxious with regard to it so to listen in the right way to listen to the body how and what the body is really saying i think is is part of all of what stanford is talking about here so thank you stanford so it's it's did you want me to uh yeah i think that's the question for now if you i'm just going to say i i'm both colin and i are not a big you know user of social media however that's one of the main ways that we have to promote ourselves nowadays so if you're here if you like us if you like what you've heard and want us to you know reach out to more people please feel free to post us or take a photo at some point like in the next few minutes and put it on your social media so that we can reach out to more people uh, I think Colin's going to do a lovely, lovely conclusion. Okay. Thank you. I wish I'd prepared for this. <laughs> I like throwing you in the deep end. Well, it, it, it's, it's good. So in, 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 in summary, everyone is completely different. Um, the back is different. It, it, it means that we're starting to look at the structure of the body and how the person interacts with their structure. We're starting to look at how someone engages with themselves and also engages with the world. We're starting to look at, is there insufficient use or a lack of maintenance? We're also looking at, and in which case we need to remobilize, we need to motivate, we need to find ways to restore and to encourage people to step up is it that there's excessive use of the body in a particular way such as and we find this quite often where people are, are consistently doing the same yoga positions again and again and again excessive use of the body in a particular direction or particular pattern it's it's almost like when someone folds forward and they fold forward with their back so that they get this length in the lower part of the back and then they come right the way back up again with the tension in the lower part of the back again. So in fact, it's like taking a, a rod and just doing this with it. It puts all the pressure into the lower part of the back. So is there, how are they, is there an excessive use of, of part of the body through the training, through the way that their patterns are working? Is it that they, Is it that there's structural issues? Is it that there's inappropriate or awkward use? And we're starting to really understand. Sorry about this. Is it, we're starting to really understand. Um, sorry about that. I lost my screen there. We're starting to really understand the, um, that there's, to get how someone gets better harmony, better sort of, coordination within the body and a greater awareness of their movement and, and for me because you're using the body as the vehicle to operate in the world to interact with yourself interact with other people to start to get this awareness to see how you're coming to be with it is the best opportunity that there is so each condition each back condition each pain will be different it's actually unique and it needs to be approached in a different way and it means that there's no magic formula for back pain and my approach and my suggestion with regard to all of this is one where we look to what yoga talks about with regard to change it gives three different possible changes and i was discussing this with a good friend earlier today 
is that change can happen in one moment. It can be like this. It goes bang, like that. Um, we call it krana in yoga. It, 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 it's, it's in an instant. It means that, like, I'm riding my horse, and I'm riding my horse, and everything's going really well, and then suddenly I find myself in the back of an ambulance, and I can't walk for a week. In one moment, this is true, this happened to me in January, in one moment, that happened. And I remember waking up in the back of an ambulance, and my mind's all over the place. Boom, 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 boom. Oh my God, can I feel my feet? How, what happened? Where's my horse? Where's the person I was riding with? Crap. All of these things, all like this. And this is the next change that can happen, is that we start to go from this point into being focused, being really focused on something. And so what we find is that we find that back pain is a huge opportunity. It's a massive opportunity for a number of things. It's an opportunity because at a moment, Akshana, one moment, things can change, but we can do something about that. And when we have a dispersion of the mind and we have all this stuff happening, we can just bring it right the way in so that we can do something about it. And the third change that's possible that I was talking to a friend about earlier today is that we can shuffle forwards and we can all shuffle forwards from a stable point in a stable place to find out what's worked, what doesn't work and know that we're going to experiment with it and we're going to find a way forwards. And I think having that hope becomes crucial as part of working with back pain. Was that okay summary, Sanford? That's a beautiful summary. Thank uh, you. <laughs> it's really kind of you. As always, it's perfect. Well, maybe we should swap it around next time. Maybe you should do the summary next time <laughs> and I can do the opening thing. Right, like, the opening. I was just like... <laughs> Um, I think I speak for myself and Colin, as well as Paul and Lauren, who work behind the scene. We thank everyone for coming. And Colin, you're going to tell us about C for next month, aren't you? Oh, yeah. So we chose, we were looking at a C. You know, as, as you kind of, you have two people that just hang out and they kind of like do, we, we geek out on various different conditions and lots of different things in, in kind of yoga and, 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 and medicine and stuff like this. And we kind of went through the C list and, and we went through it and we were kind of like, what C's are there? And we went through, we went through, and we kind of threw them around, threw them around. And we thought, you know what? Chronic fatigue. Now, chronic fatigue is very interesting. I, and I think that what next time we do is we, we're going to begin to build out on this because to understand this idea where our strength has been taken away from us, that we are so exhausted, so tired, we, you know, we, we, we don't know why. So Balakshaya, it, it means that there's this, we, we've lost our strength. Um, so I'm really excited to, to look at this next time because I think it's an amazing area. And I think that it's something that we're seeing a huge amount of now. I'm seeing a lot of exhaustion and a lot of fatigue right now. And, and this is not only because it's pre-Christmas holiday season where you're going to be overtired from all the shopping they're going to be doing for your Christmas list. So, you feel interested? Yeah, oh. it's brilliant. So this is, so this is November. So we're, we're in November the 24th, chronic fatigue. Yes. Brilliant. Okay, so can I just say thank you so much to all of you for joining. Um, 